I'm going to go ahead and call the regular City Council meeting of April 8, 2024 to order. Roll call, please. Zasada. Here. Larson. Here. Smith. Here. Perkins. Here. Verbeck. Here. Walker. Here. Mayor Barnes. Here. Seven present. All right. Then moving on to agenda item B, Pledge of Allegiance. Can we have Captain High V lead us in the pledge, please? And real quick, hang on, Shadow. Yeah, if everyone could rise and do the Pledge of Allegiance, that'd be great. Go ahead, Shadow. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you there, Captain Hy-Vee. All right, then agenda item C, approval of the agenda. I would take a motion to approve the agenda, but modified to remove ordinance or under ordinances K2, ordinance 2024-014 uh, from the agenda. So I would take a motion to approve a modified agenda. So move. Second. Moved by Alderman Perkins, seconded by Alderman uh, Verbeck. Any comments or questions? Hearing none, roll call please. Zasada? Yes. Larson? Yes. Smith? Yes. Perkins? Yes. Verbeck? Yes. Walker? Yes. Mayor Barnes? Yes. 7 I. All right, the agenda has been approved as modified. Moving on, agenda item D, presentations. Uh, this is really exciting. Uh, I had the, the, the honor of uh, introducing a lot of the IESA wrestlers and the parents and everything. Uh, the event you all were at, that was, that was incredibly cool. I think it was electrifying uh, just being in the audience and seeing uh, all the activity going on. But I wanted to make sure we recognize the ISA state wrestlers. DeKalb's middle school wrestlers had a very successful season, and a number of them placed well in state tournament on the March 8th and 9th. The team surpassed the threshold of 1,000 dual team wins this year and finished with a 27-3 and record. Is that right? It's pretty good, 27-3 and record. Um, 27 young wrestlers qualified for sectional tournament, and 17 wrestlers, including three females, went to the state tournament. The DeKalb wrestlers, their weight groups, and their final placing are in the council agenda. But what I would love is, could all of you come forward? I'm going to bring the mic, and I'd like you just to introduce yourself, your weight class, and if you placed. Can we handle that? All right, I'm coming down. You didn't think this was going to be a public There we go. All right, yeah, face the audience. Awesome. I'm going to start on the far left. That's great. You have the honor of kicking us off. So name, if you placed, and what your weight is. That would be phenomenal. Darius Russell. No, 1D5. Jaden Coleman, I play sixth, and wrestled at heavyweight. Brandon McCarter, I play sixth, and I wrestled at 112. Isabella Shell, 112. Kara Zimmerman, no, and 126. Preston Shell, second, 135. Hayes Halstead did not place 119. Matthew Frickman did not place 95. Maury Johnson did not place 215. Parker Weller, 85. Jaden Giannoni, 75, 6. Owen Burgess, 105. Julian Hernandez, I placed third, and I wrestled at 100. Larissa Gomez Guevara placed fourth, a 108. Jacob Martin, no place, uh, 90 pounds. Lucas Moncrief, 215. Noah Simonson, 90 pounds. No. Final five. All right. Now, real quick, so, some, of you, some of you said no place. And, and you made it sound like, no place. Your record was 27 and three. Every one of you qualified to be in the IESA wrestling tournament, which is incredible. You should all be incredibly proud of that particular achievement. I know all of us are, absolutely. I'm a Clinton Rosette uh, middle school graduate, uh, uh, so I'm in a DHS grad. I'm proud that you future barbs going to DHS are gonna represent the wrestling program incredibly well. So. Just want to say congratulations. I want to say thanks for coming out. And would you all mind if, if council came down? Could we get a picture with all of you? It'd be my honor if we could do that, yeah? All right. <laughs> Scott, how, how, should, how should we? Oh, sorry. Yeah? Oh, what's, what do you got? Here. State champion medal. Huh. 
and that's from the wrestling club. So the, what we were just presented with, uh, the city of DeKalb was just presented and said, thank you for all your generous support of DeKalb Wrestling. You have encouraged pride and tradition that has been instilled in DeKalb since 1954. With gratitude, the DeKalb Wrestling Club. Uh, thanks. That's, that's really cool of you all. Uh, appreciate that. All right, we got all the council here? All right. <laughs> hey, well, coaches. Whoa, whoa, yeah, yeah. Coaches, come on. All the coaches got to get in here. All right, ladies, gentlemen, thanks for coming out tonight. Parents, thanks for coming out. Coaches, uh, you all should be absolutely proud. So have a great night, you all. Good job, guys. Good job, coach. <laughs> well, there's plenty of seats now. <laughs> Jimmy! Moving on to uh, agenda item uh, D2, we have a proclamation. So it's a proclamation for National Public Safety Telecommunicators Week. Whereas emergencies can occur at any time that require police, fire, or emergency medical services. And whereas when an emergency occurs, the prompt dispatch of police officers, firefighters, and paramedics is critical to the protection of life, preservation of property, and public safety. And whereas the safety of our police officers, firefighters, and paramedics is dependent upon the quality and accuracy of information obtained by public safety telecommunicators of the City of DeKalb Emergency Communication Center. And whereas telecommunicators are the single vital communication link <coughs> among our police officers, firefighters, and paramedics by monitoring their activities, providing them with information, and ensuring their safety. Whereas telecommunicators of the city of DeKalb have contributed daily to the effective public safety response, the apprehension of criminals, the suppression of fires, and the treatment of patients. Whereas each telecommunicator has exhibited compassion, care, understanding, and professionalism during the performance of their duties. And whereas the week of April 14th through 20th, 2024, has been designated as National Public Safety Telecommunicators Week by the Association of Public Safety Communications Officials, APCO, and recognized nationally by proclamation of the United States Congress. Now therefore, I, Cohen Barnes, Mayor of the City of DeKalb, Illinois, do hereby declare recognition and celebration of National Public Safety Telecommunicators Week from April 14th through April 20th, 2024, in the City of DeKalb. Let's give our telecommunicators a round of applause. All right, I think I have some of you here, so uh, yeah. uh, council, if you want to come down, let's give them a nice Photoshop, or photo pop. Photoshop. Steve? Hopefully they'll Photoshop a little of this one. That would be great. Fly you in the back room. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, hi. You guys get in the middle first. Steve's coming down, too. Oh, there. Steve, we're getting this one. Okay, I got it. Are we good? Three, two, Then moving on to, oh, they got 
got that. Agenda item E, public participation. I think we have Ms. Martinez here and, yes, Ms. Martinez, please. And as a reminder, you have three minutes for your public comment. Ever since I was, ever since I for the first time spoke at the February 12th, 2024 DeKalb City Council meeting, and to date, the minutes have never documented that I clearly, for instance, said that I am a victim of intimidation and a witness of intimidation, and that I said I am Hispanic and being denied independent and criminal investigations. Despite the fact the city of DeKalb and the city council are aware, I and my brother reported official misconduct discrimination involving, for instance, DeKalb City Manager Bill Nicholas. And despite the fact there is precedent that city managers have been investigated before. Instead, the city of DeKalb and the city council has been dissuading and intimidating me, a victim and a witness of intimidation, for publicly coming forward. For instance, at the first city council meeting I attended, the following occurred. One, to defend DeKalb City Manager Bill Nicholas, Alderman Scott McAdams publicly targeted and attacked me, a victim and a witness. Alderman McAdams can no longer stand in the way of my efforts to hold, for instance, Bill Nicholas accountable, since after using racial slurs, Alderman McAdams resigned. Two, with City of DeKalb Chief of Police David Byrd being present, Bill Nicholas was allowed to target, attack, and further retaliate, intimidate, and dissuade me, a victim and witness, for publicly reporting his official misconduct. And Bill Nicholas publicly cooperated the fact DeKalb of Chief of Police Byrd, DeKalb Police, and Bill Nicholas, in fact, verbally intimidated and threatened my brother with arrest and false charges of trespass and harassment, including Bill Nicholas filing a false complaint to silence a witness who's been illegally prevented from attending city council meetings, which is information that DeKalb City Council and city attorney are aware and are taking part in covering up and allowing to continue, where Bill Nicholas also intentionally made statements he knew to be false to the public and the press in order to deliberately discredit witnesses and to misrepresent the matter as it relates to me and my family's particular situation. This is clear intimidation that requires an investigation. Subsequently, in a February 2024 post, Alderman Carolyn Morris Zada made statements she knew to be false as it relates to me and my family's particular situation. While as Alderwoman, she also publicly implicated the City of DeKalb and the DeKalb City Council of breaking the law by representing that these matters have been discussed for years, which could have only taken place in secret without public knowledge and our participation. It is in the best interest of everyone involved to have a finding of fact with independent and criminal investigations, which this council and the City of DeKalb are preventing from being conducted or even being called for. The fact is, for instance, Alderman Zazada and the City Council are the ones being accused of criminal wrongdoing. It is not good faith to have them to continue to de deny me and my family independent and criminal investigations, which should have already been provided and should now, without any further hesitation or delay, be called for in good faith. Thank you. All right, moving on to agenda item F, uh, appointments. We have public participation by Mr. Charbot. There is no appointment for the vacant city clerk office. City clerk statute states that an appointment of a new city clerk to serve until the next municipal election, the statute says, shall appoint. The appointment must take place within 60 days of vacancy. In a published news article, Mayor Barnes stated that he's not inclined to appoint a new clerk, which would be contrary to what is in state law, ILCS 65. 3.125 says clerk and treasurer if a vacancy occurs in the office of city clerk or city treasurer it shall be filled by the mayor with advice and consent of the city council the person so appointed shall hold office for the unexpired term of the officer elected the statute goes on to say the appointment must be made within 60 days of the vacancy occurrence so you have about 49 days left you manage to start the process with the vacant position of alderman, you need to fill the city clerk position. Doesn't matter if you didn't like what the previous city clerk did. Also on the topic of appointments, there are no appointments for the Human Relations Commission. How many times I gotta come up here and talk about this? It has been four months since you gutted the HRC, Mr. Mayor. I remind the council that on February 26th, Mayor Barnes stated he would make appointments part of the next council agenda. That meeting was on March 12th. No appointments occurred. 
For that matter, no appointments occurred at the March 26th meeting or the March 12th meeting. The March 26th meeting, of course, was canceled because the mayor was on vacation. So let the record show that no appointments will be occurring at this meeting either. Your state rep run is done. It's time to get back to doing the job you are paid to do by the taxpayers. Make the appointments. It's in the actual approved meeting minutes that you were going to make appointments at the March 12th meeting. Please be truthful with the people. Thank you. Uh, let's see, so moving on to agenda item G, consent agenda. One, minutes of the regular city council meeting of March 11th, 2024. Two, minutes of the regular city council meeting of March 25th, 2024. Accounts payable and payroll through March 25th, 2024 in the amount of $3,633,374.30. Number four, accounts payable and payroll through April 8th, 2024 in the amount of $1,291,088.14. Investment and bank balance summary through February 2024 year-to-date revenues and expenditures through February 2024, Freedom of Information Act FOIA report, February 2024, Crime-Free Housing Bureau report, March 2024, DeKalb County Economic Development Corporation, FY 2023 annual report, DeKalb Chamber of Commerce, FY 2023 annual report, DeKalb County Convention and Visitors Bureau, FY 2023 annual report, and the DeKalb Municipal Ban, FY 2023 annual report. Can I have a motion to approve the consent agenda? So moved. Second. Moved by Alderman Larson, seconded by Alderman Walker. Uh, any questions or comments on the consent agenda? <coughs> Hearing none, roll call please. Larson? Yes. Smith? Yes. Perkins? Yes. Verbeck? Yes. <coughs> Walker? Yes. Zasada? Yes. Mayor Barnes? Yes. 7i? Uh, consent agenda has been approved. Moving on to agenda item H, public hearings, we have none. Moving on to agenda item I, considerations, we have none. And moving on to agenda item J, resolutions. I have to recuse myself because I own a commercial property in the TIF district, which requires me, according to state statute, to not participate in the conversation for uh, resolution 2024-030, uh, resolution 2024-031, and resolution 2024-032. Um, so I, I would take a motion to uh, approve Greg Perkins uh, for running the next meeting, or next three sections of the meeting, or if you want to. Sure. Okay, <laughs> all right. Uh, trying to spread it around a little bit. Uh, I have a, well, you can't motion probably to approve your own. I would take a motion. So to moved. Perfect. Second. <laughs> moved by Alderwoman uh, Larson, seconded by Alderman uh, Verbeck. And at this point, I will hand the gavel over to Alderman Perkins. Sorry, I'm just surprised. <laughs> yeah, okay. Uh, but yeah, just ask Technically for it. Oh, yeah, sorry. Yeah, it can be roll, roll call, please. Or non -roll call. You, you can do either or. Just do roll call. All right. Um, Smith? Yes. Yeah, Perkins? <coughs> oh, sorry, what? Perkins? Yes. Vervik? Yes. Walker? Yes. Sasada? Yes. Larson? Yes. Mayor Barnes? Okay. Yes. Seven nine. <coughs> Be nice and take it easy on, on Greg. All right. <laughs> Surprise. Um, resolution 2024-30, authorizing an architectural improvement AIP economic incentive for 235 East Lincoln Highway in the amount of $25,000. <coughs> Hannigan Partners, LLC, Bonner and Bonner Art. Can I get a motion to bring it to the floor? So Second. Second. City Manager. Thank you, Mr. Acting Chair. <laughs> yeah. uh, so the next four resolutions, or the first four <coughs> resolutions, uh, deal with activity within the TIF district. And the first one, as you mentioned in the title, can you hear me all right? Okay. Is uh, concerns a, a TIF AIP application uh, by uh, the Bonners, uh, who are doing business as Hannigan Partners. They're in the audience tonight and would be happy to answer any questions you may have. There's Alyssa. Thank you. Uh, so they uh, <coughs> bought what used to be known as the Blue Door property in downtown DeKalb and are intent on doing some, and, and have, have started doing some remodeling, but have some major remodeling ahead. And I've identified what those pieces are. Uh, and uh, in, in page four of your background, you can see the breakdown by masonry repair. Uh, uh, there's uh, exterior lighting and signage, there's HVAC 
work to be done, uh, awning replacement, replacing the front door and, the, and windows and the back door and so forth. And uh, they have uh, qualified in each of these for the 50-50 uh, cost sharing in our AIP program. But another thing that I, I brought to your attention in the background and for you to know is that, uh, and we'll get to this in the next item, um, there is a unique, unique situation on their west wall. Uh, like a lot of buildings that were built in the central core of the downtown 100 plus years ago, uh, they had exterior masonry walls and many of the buildings that abutted each other had uh, common wall uh, designations of where their property began and ended. So uh, sometimes if it was basically three courses of brick thick, this outer wall, the inner course, or maybe the first two courses were uh, the, the property on one side, and then the last outer course was the property on the other side. <clears throat> so there was a building next door to them, and that was torn down with city assistance back in the late 2000s, 2008, I believe it was. And um, it wasn't until later, almost seven years later, that uh, then there was a, a, the uh, proposition to create uh, a redevelopment corner uh, by the Pappas development and that eventually built uh, across all of the property that had been torn down except for about a seven foot wide a pathway which uh, as you know goes from Lincoln Highway uh, down to Van Buren Plaza. So it happens that the outer wall uh, on the what's now the Bonner building uh, was through an easement that was struck back in the early 2000s uh, made into uh, uh, a responsibility in terms of ma maintenance and repair of the city. Uh, in addition, the city wanted to assure that uh, the lighting, and you see some lighting there now if you've been up and down that pathway recently, that there'd be some city control over that lighting, that we'd have the ability to do that, and also provide some surve camera surveillance just for the security of people going into, uh, a, a, not a dark, but a dark, a, a not so light, <laughs> Uh, kind of a comfortable kind of lighting, but not bright lighting. So uh, I, I bring this up in this context just to let you know there's other work to be done, and uh, I'd like the council to act on that now. The next item is concerns the tuck pointing of the exterior wall, which uh, is under the control of the city of DeKalb. Uh, we vetted this in, in many ways, and. Uh, they, the family, the Bonners have been very cooperative and they have a lot of work ahead of them and would like council action tonight and we support that. Comments? Alderman, Alderman Larson. Um, I'm just very supportive of this. That's to me like right in the heart of downtown and you know, whatever business is there and having an art studio would be fabulous. but just to have everything in, in proper physical shape and just how the buildings look, I think um, I'm, I'm for this. Alderwoman Zasada. Yeah, I, I too support this. I'm <clears throat> excited to see us uh, take care of the bricks. I think that's really important. Thank you. Okay, can we get a vote? Perkins? Yes. Verbeck? Yes. Walker? Yes. Sasada? Yes. Larson? Yes. Smith? Yes. Six I. Resolution passes. Resolution 2024-031 authorizing an agreement with Weber Construction in the amount of 39700 for repairs to the city controlled exterior brick wall at 235 East Lincoln Highway. City Manager. Thank you. Well, I've set the table for this. Uh, I'm sorry. Yeah, motion. Into this. Thank you. So oh, I'm sorry. Can I, can I get a motion and a second? Right. So moved. So moved. Oh, I don't know who said it. Second. Your ladies Motion by Alderman Walker, seconded by Alderwoman Zasada. My apologies. Details, details. <coughs> okay. Uh, so are we ready? We're ready to go. I think so. Thank you. Uh, <coughs> I've already set, set this up. Uh, Andy Rye, who's the Assistant Director of Public Works, uh, requested bids for the 
exterior wall, exterior brick courses of the wall that we've been talking about. And the lowest responsible bid was that submitted by Weaver Construction in the amount of $39,700. It's a substantial amount of tuck pointing and, and there's some brick replacement in there as well. And we recommend uh, your approval. This would be work that would go along uh, coincident with roofing <coughs> work that's being done and some additional, uh, there's gonna be some additional brickwork by another contractor on the roof working with the roofing contractor. Any comments? Alderwoman Larson. I just have a question. So we <coughs> can use TIF monies on city-owned property. <coughs> yes, we. You know, we did. We certainly did in the downtown with the uh, uh, reconfiguration of the uh, Lincoln Highway corridor. That was 1.8 million dollars worth. Okay. So, and it makes perfect sense to use that. That's what this was dedicated for, which is a re in this case. Uh, rejuvenation of some downtown business buildings. Mm -hmm. Can we get a vote, please? Verbeck? Yes. Walker? Yes. Sasada? Yes. Larson? Yes. Smith? Yes. Perkins? Yes. 6 I. Resolution passes. Resolution 2024-32, authorizing an architectural improvement economic incentive for 118 North 3rd Street in the amount of $2,982.50. Lauren Woods, Dash Cracker Jack. Can I get a motion and a second to bring it to the floor? So moved. Second. Alderman, I mean, City Manager. Mr. Nicholas, <laughs> City Manager Nicholas. Uh, <laughs> so, a uh, smaller project, but very critical to the life of another downtown business, Cracker Jack's uh, uh, was unfortunately hit with uh, uh, a, a major uh, uh, issue uh, in the plumbing uh, in their basement. Um, the, it was an emergency repair, uh, and um, you, you have a couple pictures in your background just to illustrate uh, just how formidable it was. The building was shut down uh, during the course of this uh, for the better part of a week as well, which led to a loss of business and a loss of revenue, obviously. Uh, but uh, what has been applied for here is just focused on the plumbing repairs and uh, the uh, repairs in this case qualify under that 50-50 uh, fl flight or tier of AIP funding. So we recommend strongly that uh, you help out. We've done other emergency repairs and I've highlighted those in the background. Comments? Alderman Walker. Yeah, hey, um, thank you for this one. This is a great lady, great business, known her for over almost 25 years. And yeah, I would have given her more, but hey, good job. Thank you. Can we get a vote, please? Walker? Yes. Sasada? Yes. Larson? Yes. Smith? Yes. Perkins? Yes. Verbeck? Yes. Six I. One more, Mayor. Oh, is it? Yes. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Resolution 2024-033, authorizing an architectural improvement economic incentive for 209 Grove Street in the amount of $23,800. Mike Warfel. I'm sorry? $23,380. $23,380, yes. <laughs> Could I get a motion and a second to bring it to the floor, please? So moved. Second. City Manager. So uh, this is another uh, substantial gutting and remodeling uh, project. Uh, the, the building, some, some of you may remember, uh, and there's a, a much faded sign on the back uh, it's called the Wizard Building. I, I don't know if I ever knew that, but uh, I know it now. We all know it now. Um, and uh, Mr. Warfel has been uh, working with the building department and has been uh, considering several other uh, uses for this rather than a games place. And uh, he's looking now at an office uh, 
uh, type of use. His original uh, preference was they have some kind of a coffee shop, which might have worked out, but uh, uh, the extraordinary plumbing expense and, and uh, uh, the uh, uh, restroom expenses to bring it up to code uh, was beyond his means, even at 50%. So he's uh, settled on an office use and he's working that out right now. But uh, we've, we've seen the, the estimates and we've seen what he intends to do and feel that it meets our guidelines and recommend its approval. Comments? I have a question. Alderwoman Walker, or Larson. Um, I, I see where you came from. On the number four resolution, it says 23,380, but then down below it says council approval of 23,800. So what it's, dollar amount uh, are we I'm sorry, uh, a, um, a typo on my part is 23,380. 380, okay. Just wanted to clarify the vote. Thank you. Any further comments? Can we get a vote, please? Sasada? Yes. Larson? Yes. Smith? Yes. Perkins? Yes. Burbank? Yes. Walker? Yes. Six I? Resolution passes. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks. All right. Thanks, Alderman Perkins. Um, then I'm going to go on to uh, was that two nine? Number five. I don't. I don't know. Five on page six. Is it? Well, no, no, no. I'm, no, I'm sorry. Yeah. I've got a. Uh, uh, City Council speaker request form that was just given to me, and 2024-029. There isn't a, there isn't a 2024-029. It's number nine, Mayor, in resolution. Oh, number nine. Oh yeah, okay. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I got gotcha. you. It was weird because they're usually in order. I didn't. That's where I got lost in that one. All right, so. Uh, we're at one, two, three, thirty-three. So we're on number five, correct? Two zero correct. two four dash zero three four. Perfect. All right. I've taken motion to bring resolution two zero two four dash zero three four, approving a package liquor license for Suman Liquors Incorporated, doing business as American Liquors, located at one fifty nine West Lincoln Highway. Can I have a motion? So, so moved. Second. Moved by Alderman Smith, seconded by Alderwoman Larson, City Manager. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Uh, this, this application uh, has been going through the process. Uh, if the council approves, then there's a conditional license issued. It has to still go through the, the uh, state level, but um, they have uh, otherwise met our minimum requirements in our local code to qualify for a license, and uh, uh, we recommend your approval. City Council, any comments or questions? Hearing none, roll call, please. Larson? Yes. Smith? Yes. Perkins? Yes. Burbick? Yes. Walker? Yes. Zasada? Yes. Mayor Barnes? Yes. 7 I. Resolution 2024-034 passes. Number six, resolution 2024-035, approving the regulation of traffic for the purpose of holding a Cinco de Mayo celebration on Illinois Route 38 Lincoln Highway between 1st Street and 4th Street on Sunday, May 5th, 2024, from 9 a.m. to 8 p.m. Can I have a motion to bring it to the floor? So, so moved. Second. Moved by Alderman Perkins, seconded by Alderman Verbeck, city manager. Uh, thank you, Mayor. As you can see in the background, uh, this is an event which is expanding, and that's a good thing. Uh, downtown merchants have embraced uh, what was sort of piloted last year, and uh, by expansion, <coughs> it involves the clothing, closing of Lincoln, maybe the clothing too, there might be clothing out there, closing of Lincoln Highway. And uh, I want to thank uh, Andy Rye uh, for volunteering uh, his, his division, actually, to be very much involved in this. Obviously, uh, we, it's like a, a mini, very mini version of what we do every fall when uh, the uh, Corn Fest is in play in terms of the, the uh, closing of Lincoln Highway. But uh, among the uh, downtown businesses that have been very much involved in the planning of this are the Wilret Flower Company, El Himador Mexican Grill, um, and also members of the Citizen uh, Community Enhancement Commission. 
Uh, this, this year, uh, it's going to be more than just people kind of strolling between businesses, which was very nice and pleasant, but this year we'll have some local bands in the closed street area, DJ, uh, a lowrider car show, food trucks, children's area, and numerous vendors. Uh, recommend your approval. All right, City Council, questions or comments? Yeah, last year they piloted it from Lincoln Highway to mm -hmm. uh, the railroad tracks on 3rd Street, right. and it was a huge success. So it is really cool that uh, our merchants are stepping up. Um, I know they're going to have bands, they're going to have dancers. Uh, it's just going to be a, a, a whole event that would be really cool to see if over time the Cinco de Mayo celebration is something that DeKalb and downtown DeKalb is known for. So really, really excited about that. Uh, hearing no other comments or questions, roll call please. Smith? Yes. Perkins? Sounds fun. Yes. <laughs> Burbank? <coughs> yes. Walker? Yes. Sasada? Yes. Larson? Yes. Mayor Barnes? Yes. 7 I. Resolution 2024-035 passes. Number seven, resolution 2024-036, authorizing the purchase of one combination sewer cleaning hydro excavation vehicle <coughs> through Brown Equipment in the amount of $575,830. Can I have a motion to bring it to the floor? So moved. Second. Moved by Alderwoman Larson, seconded by Alderman Perkins, city manager. Thank you, Mayor. We discussed this big piece of equipment when we were going through the water department um, um, budget back in November and December. So it, it is uh, a, a multi-person, purpose, I'm sorry, uh, vehicle. We've uh, been using a vector for some years now. We know how important it is in doing excavations, particularly those that are around some sensitive underground infrastructure. So we don't have sharp objects and people with shovels taking a chance on whether they're going to hit some wire or, or gas or something like that. It, it also saves on the backs of our employees, and this being new, uh, we'll have an opportunity through the water fund uh, to continue to do this hydro excavating for a long time with this particular vehicle. And we, just to make sure that we would like what we're getting, uh, we uh, inquired of the two lower bidders uh, if the possibility was there for us to use it for a little while, and they, the, in this case, the. Uh, the company that we're recommending tonight, uh, the uh, sewer cleaning is the name, uh, basically it's the name, and uh, that it's being sold through Brown Equipment, allowed us to have it for uh, a couple of weeks. Uh, fell in love, the guys fell in love with it. It actually works. <laughs> so uh, we recommend strongly uh, that you approve <coughs> this. Uh, we're within our budget that we had uh, put before you and that you approved back in December. City Council, questions, comments? I, I, get, I had one question. When they were talking about blowing out the storm sewers that mm -hmm. get clogged with debris, um, how do we handle, like, because I'm sure bottles and plastic and everything gets caught up in there, too. Yeah. How do we make sure that doesn't get just pushed right into the Kishwaukee River? Well, it's a vacuum and Oh, it is. Okay. And I thought flusher. it was a push power. No? We okay. go both directions. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. So I'm assuming our street department would make sure that, I don't think Andy's here, um, that well, he there was, was here. Are you? Uh, but when you when you Hi. one of the one of the vendors worldwide is a company called Vac All. Uh, yeah. So it really started with some way to like pull another way that something like this is very valuable on the vacuum side is if you get into an excavation and there's pea gravel, you, you really can't set it to the side, it just keeps caving in, caving in, caving in. And that leads to the higher risk for the laborers that are in a ditch. So uh, that's that's another key use <coughs> for it, and, and uh, it's something that we, we've come to rely on and, and would hate to do without, frankly. Yeah, great piece of equipment. Any other comments or questions? Hearing none, roll call, please. Perkins? Yes. Verbeck? Yes. Walker? Yes. Zasada? Yes. Larson? Yes. Smith? Yes. Mayor Barnes? Yes. Seven I? Resolution 2024-036 passes. Number eight, resolution 2024-037, authorizing a specialized aviation service operation, SASO, SASO, agreement and community hangar lease with Illinois Aviation Academy, IAA. Can I have a motion to bring it to the floor? So moved. Second. Second. Moved by Alderman Verbeck, seconded by Alderwoman Larson, city manager. Looking around the audience, is there someone here representing the company? Oh, okay. Uh, fair amount of background here. Uh, first of all, explaining what a SASO is, kind of the 
uh, acronym that's used in uh, airport uh, management and operations, but um, it's basically a, a commercial agreement with, in this case, uh, a group that can provide flight, flight instruction, a ground school, uh, minor maintenance of aircraft to start, and then uh, there are other things that are provided by this company that's been established since the 90s and working out of DuPage Airport and DuPage County but has been very much aware of us and looking to expand out into DeKalb and is aware that we are experiencing growth, corporate and otherwise. And so they uh, <coughs> were willing to, rate, to rent uh, some space in our community hangar and also uh, a small office space uh, in the main terminal building. Uh, the, the rates here are competitive uh, in our direction and uh, we are, um, Hopeful that you'll support our staff recommendation to approve this. City Council, questions or comments? Yeah, I know quite a few people who have used them. I had nothing but good things to say and a great experience, so uh, they're definitely welcome. Um, roll call, please, I guess. Vervik? Yes. Walker? Yes. Sasada? Yes. Larson? Yes. Smith? Yes. Perkins? Yes. Mayor Barnes? Yes. 7 I. Resolution 2024-037 passes. Now moving on to number nine, resolution 2024-029. We have some public participation. Um, usury, I'm gonna get the last name wrong, I'm sorry. Uh, Katum, uh, but please correct me, but come on up to the uh, microphone. And just a reminder, you have three minutes. Okay. Hello everyone, thank you again for <coughs> your time and uh, considering what I have to present. I'm just here following up from our meeting uh, back in March to answer any questions or any uh, you know, comments you might have. I've had a meeting with City Manager Bill Nicholas about the license that's in question and the restriction we're adding. So um, I'll open it up for any questions or anything you want to discuss. We'll have the city manager give a review and then we'll definitely call you back up as questions come up. That's oh. right. All right, All right cool. Perfect. Thank Thanks. you. And then I also have um, Marsha Crouch, is it? Thank and Marcia, you. you have three minutes to okay, speak. Okay, thank you. You betcha. Um, I am the owner of White Oak Tax Solutions. I am the building that is directly connected to the 7-Eleven that he is purchasing. Um, I've seen a lot of foot traffic come through there. I don't think it was closed prior to um, it being uh, closed because of not having enough business. I think it was just they couldn't find employees that could keep it open. There's definitely enough um, people in the area that would like to see the convenience area, and I would also really think it would bring um, a good asset to our business, too, with the foot traffic. So just wanted to throw that out there. All right. Thank you, ma'am. All right. Uh, I would take a motion to bring Resolution 2024-029 to the floor. So moved. Second. Moved by Alderman Zazada, seconded by Alderman Walker. A city manager. Uh, thank you, Mayor. We had a, a pretty good uh, full discussion of this back on March 11th, and it comes back, and one of the things that's happened uh, in between, Musery mentioned this, we had a face-to-face -face with Musery and, and Mr. Michael Susie, he and his family are the owner of the building, and uh, w one of the pieces that I was directed to, to raise was uh, it w was there some type of a metal road, was there some type of a hybrid uh, type of layout that uh, would accommodate uh, Usury's uh, uh, more recent interest in having packaged liquor there uh, as opposed to just a convenience store. And so we've, we've come a ways. Uh, the most recent uh, uh, concept for what uh, uh, the petitioner is looking to do is in your background and was copied for everybody's review. Uh, it started as, as you know, as a, a proposal to have a, a like a deli with a, with a convenience side to it and maybe even a little seating area for tables and chairs and such. I think that was generally well supported. Uh, but uh, then uh, Usury had mentioned, uh, I understand, uh, there's, there's some money in sales of alcohol and uh, so by mixing that in, 
uh, created a little bit of a conundrum, which is what we addressed in March, at the March meeting, the first March meeting. And uh, so uh, in the process of, of working out a, a, a re revised concept, uh, I, I couldn't help but notice that there were a number of uh, refrigerated uh, uh, units in the aisles. And of course they can be used for display of pre-made sandwiches and the like, milk and so forth, but it also can be used for the sale of beer. And this was more than just uh, the occasional six pack that was gonna go with a deli product out the door with the customer. And I think now we're, we're, we're in the direction of something else than what was originally portrayed to the council, which got my enthusiasm, frankly. And so in my uh, recommendation here, I, I'm recommending no change in the package liquor sale provisions that had been contemplated as one of the things that could be done at the last meeting. And uh, I'm not recommending the, the liquor license proposal. City Council, questions or comments? Alderman Perkins. So as, as, the, as the Alderman of, of, of that ward, um, feedback I've gotten has been pretty clear. Everyone is very, very receptive to the thought of a deli or a convenience store. It's equally clear that no one is in favor of another package liquor store in that area. Um, I understand the way our codes currently are. It's an either or proposition. Either you have a package liquor license or you don't. So to me, I can't get behind an entire package liquor license. If our, if our codes evolve to a way or or they can just do something simple like a couple beers or something, that's a different discussion. But the way it is now, I'm, I'm with you. I, I can't get behind and support this. The, the people of the fourth ward aren't behind it either. Alderman Burke. I look at a market on North First Street. I look at their, their floor plan. So <clears throat> trying to figure out a way of you know what is fair and that market on North First Street has groceries, deli, meats and whatnot, and a small carve-out section for alcoholic beverages, beer and wine. I don't know, is that 10% of their floor space over there? I'm not sure, but what if we discussed a percentage of maintaining just a percentage of their floor space, let's say it's 10% or limited to 10%, offering up still that opportunity to sell a few spirits, but within reason. No, I don't support the package liquor store either. We've already got one in your ward down the street. So, right. But yet the deli idea is welcome. So what, what could be a compromise that would work out for you? City Manager, I don't know if you have a response to well, the 10%, well we, 20%. We, we talked that through and, and yep. so to, to put a, maybe a finer point on it, uh, in this drawing, I, I don't see how uh, there couldn't be the, the gradual drift toward having this basically devoted, at least all the refrigerated parts, not the frozen parts, obviously, but the refrigerated parts. You, you could fill them with, with beer overnight so, and, and, and wine. So that's, uh, to, to uh, get back to Alderman Perkins, uh, that's a different horse than we thought we were going to be dealing with. In the, the difference between selling beer and wine only and selling everything, mm -hmm. all packaged liquors, um, is that a different liquor it's license? Different. Well, yeah, it's a, it's a packaged store is what's, what's a potential for a packaged store is what I see here. And I mentioned this to, to you three and, and uh, it hasn't changed. It's, uh, uh, in fact, right behind the main counter, it says alcohol. I assume that's liquor uh, shorties or whatever it is. Uh, and, and we have a, a very fine store right down the block. Uh, it's the biggest one in DeKalb. My, my clarification, is there a liquor license that specifies beer and wine only? Uh, package, yeah, okay. go ahead. No. Okay. Uh, there are not. There is not. Uh, yeah. There are way that, the way that we could limit this, like I said, is that the liquor commissioner uh, has the approval of a, could approve what's called a, a business plan. plan or premises plan. I know, based off yeah. of square footage, but then yeah. we talked about the whole well, enforcement piece It's not of just it. the square footage, it could be that you're only, you know, your business plan here is only to sell beer and wine, right? Mm. Um, and then, yeah, the enforcement is just like any other liquor enforcement matter. So, uh, but that would be, part of the application would be a plan that was submitted to uh, the liquor commissioner, uh, and that's, 
you know, uh, it would be something that hopefully we would have seen before, you know, uh, it was considered here today, right? Okay. Yeah. Thanks for the clarification. Uh, any other comments or questions? Alderwoman Larson. I kind of would follow along with Alderman Verbeek is that I could maybe get behind this if it was beer and wine that you're, you're, you know, it's part of coming in the deli and, and having us, you know, grab some sandwiches and a six pack or whatever to take home. Um, but like a full liquor package store, no. Because I think the one on North First Street, do they even have any cold? I think it started off as like a wine yeah. cellar. And it was right. strictly fancier <coughs> wines to go mm -hmm. with maybe a nice cut of meat or something. Right, right. Uh, that's the only way I could get behind this. Alderman Walker. Uh, I'm kind of like with the, it's, it's one or the other. Like, uh, well, can I ask him a question? Yeah, absolutely. You want to come with the microphone, sir? So if I can ask you, so, and I know, just be honest with me, because, mm -hmm. you know, the basketball game's on and I'm missing Purdue. Mm -hmm. So... <laughs> Are you trying to make most of your money selling these sandwiches and snacks, or are you trying to make real money selling beer? No, as I mentioned when I was here at the last meeting, my vision is to open up very much like a former, like a 7-Eleven, mm -hmm. but as an independent, uh, you know, uh, business. And, you know, that's verbatim what I addressed the council in, in my last meeting, so. So let me ask you this. So mm -hmm. would you still want to open your business if you didn't get this liquor license? Do you still think you can make a good living the, or good money there? No, the liquor license uh, would help the businesses getting foot traffic to the store. And the proposed layout that I've given here would, in my mind, this shows the areas that are restricted to alcohol sales because I thought when we discussed it last time my understanding was you wanted to see exactly where in the store you could potentially carry alcohol so that if you ever walk into the store any area where I have designated anything um, that's not does not indicate alcohol on there that alcohol would never be present and my understanding from the last meeting is that this layout would be on file with the city so that any time they can come in and, um, you know, to address, you know, Bill's concern or question, you came in and there's a 10-door cooler, says juice pop milk, that if there was alcohol beverages, I would be, uh, you know, going against my license. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Comments or questions? Others? All the women is on. I just, I hate to see a business not come together when we have someone who wants to do this. And I mean, I'm looking at this, um, I'm like trying to zoom in on it on my computer because it's hard to read actually. So, um, <laughs> so I'm seeing on this, uh, floor plan. Alcoholic beverages in the middle, some alcoholic beverages behind the counter, and then a beer case on the side. Is that, is that right? Those yeah. three spots? Yeah. So in, in that, where I have it restricted to the main uh, cooler that I have designated is a cold box that would be where the beer section would be. And then in that aisle, it would only be restricted in that uh, aisle that's marked uh, for where you know alcohol you know may be present and then behind the counter you know that's the three locations and you know and I was doing this again this as I indicated on here it's a proposed layout my vision was or what Bill and I had discussed was a uh, a restriction for 25% of the floor area. And, and so this was doing sort of a layout where, you know, I would, you know, be, I uh, felt that would be well represent that restriction in, in floor space. And so, so mm, sorry. Um, and so I guess, what I'm getting from city manager is that the sense that you got from walking through there was that this doesn't quite represent it? Um, 
as, as I look at, I can read a plan, yeah. <laughs> Bonantis, for a while, and I, I, uh, I, I see one, two, three fairly large uh, refrigerated sections, not including the alcohol behind the counter. And it seems to me to exceed 25% or a, a, you know, a, a minimal. Uh, and uh, even though uh, I, I put in your background the pictures that show uh, another place, not this place, but another place that is set up to be a, a uh, convenience store, uh, I, I see this, uh, nothing would keep you from it, particularly if you just went behind into the storage area and got six packs of beer rather than six packs of pop. Uh, it's that simple. We don't have people who can go down there and check it every day. So uh, I, I don't know how we, you, you can't, and, and then what are we gonna do, take them to court? Because uh, I think you had two six packs over the line, a judge is gonna throw that out of court. So, uh, you know, it's, it's a little bit of the honor system, and and, uh, and and it's a little bit of just what practice is. You have employees who, you know, they're they're told to fill the, when they have more beer in the back, they'll fill it with beer. So I, I, I'm just saying this is not what we started with. We're all delighted with the idea of a convenience store, and and particularly that deli idea. There's no no place. We've got 2,000 people working just a quarter of a mile down the road. And they just, they bring their lunches or they eat, uh, there's something sometimes that the, the owner uh, or the construction contractor will buy for them, but they don't have the time except to go to a convenience store and buy sandwiches. They don't have time to sit in a restaurant. Alderman Perkins. So, so follow up on things. So the, the behind the counter space, will that be half pints and little fireball shooters? So that's reserved for if there's any expensive items or you know potentially high risk items uh, that might people you know might steal. Um, well, but will it be half pints and little fireball shooters? I was over in Creston, you know, I'm gassed up over in Creston this week, and sure enough, they had them right there in the front, and I get it. But where I'm going with that is is currently the way the licensing is set up, you either have a package license or you don't. Mm -hmm. There is no room in the current structure for some for a deli mm -hmm. with half pints and fireball shooters behind the counter in the backyard of, of a school. Mm -hmm. So I mean that's that's my big heartburn with it is that even though I understand that that you're going to limit the scope of things, the the fact is the way the, the structure is right now you either have a package license or you don't. And if you have a package license, that's a lucrative side of business. You know, that's, that we're counting on a control mechanism where we have limited resources that pushes it to the liquor commissioner. You know, so I, I understand your business model. I get that and welcome, love the thought of the, the convenience store and of the deli, but going down this path and essentially overturning all the precedent that we have established within the community, that's, that's my big sticking point. Again, love the deli, love the convenience store, even, even a few beers and some wine, I'm 100 behind it 100%. And point of clarification for me before I call him Alderman Walker, all of our liquor licenses, including the one on First Street, is a full package liquor license. They're just choosing to sell only some wine, right. essentially. Yeah. yeah, we don't have a beer and right. wine liquor classification. Right. We could create that as an amendment to our code. Of I understand, yeah. Right. yeah, it's okay. another, and our yeah. liquor code is already uh, pretty is that, convoluted. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. But so uh, there's no precedence out there of a, a, submit a business plan to the liquor commissioner that says X, Y, or Z. Um, we, it, we've never done that. Yeah, it could, it could surely, it can be done. Yeah, I understand. Code. But yeah. it hasn't been done, it has, is my question. Not, okay. not to my knowledge. Okay. Alderman Walker. Yeah, see, I'm kind of with uh, all the persons Zosada with this because we don't really want to turn away businesses because that 4th Street kind of looks like a ghost town. You know, it's like we're neglecting it. However, we do just have a liquor store right down the street. And we have mm -hmm. a school, you know, just on the other side of the building. So I guess this is the first time I'm speechless. <laughs> I, 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 it's not, you know, because do we really want to turn 
a way of business since everybody else likes to come to the cow, you know, do you know, want to make people jump through hoops and bounds just to get a business here. However, you do have to understand where we're coming from. And, you know, with Alder Person um, Perkins, you know, it's his ward and his constituents is, you know, telling him that they do not want another liquor store in the area if that's what it solely is going to end up, you know. So, you know, it's just, uh, you know, this is, how can we meet in the middle? Is there a way? Mayor Barnes, we can meet in the middle on this I, one? Or I think the, the meet in the middle piece, though, is we'd be moving into, uh, it, it, and not that I'm scared to move into unprecedented territories, but it is, if, if we had them submit a business plan specifically stating X, Y, or Z, it is the enforcement piece. We, we don't have the manpower for it. If we did, city manager's right, then we could come and say, hey, you're not supposed to do this. They could fight, appeal, courts, um, yeah. and, and it's just something that we don't have. And then on top of um, two liquor stores close together, like Andy Glenn North is a perfect example with the two liquor stores next to each other. I've, I've heard about that since day one. How could we ever let something like that happen? Uh, to have two liquor stores side by side in that case. Um, this is two liquor stores, to, maybe not a stone's throw, but if you've got a good arm, it's kind of a stone's throw uh, from each other. And then we've got a liquor store that literally the, the adjacent property is a school. Now, it's not a school building, I understand. They're far enough according to our code from the actual building itself. But the property is adjacent right there, and that means all those kids uh, go by the liquor store, whether it's coming from uh, Huntley Middle School, uh, I've seen the old high school, Huntley Middle School, uh, or Founders uh, Elementary School. All those are the considerations that we're hearing about from Alderman Walker. I think Alderman Mrs. Zada beat you. Or yeah, no? that's fine. Okay, all right. Yeah, it, it is really challenging. And like he said, we don't want to turn anyone away. However, I, I did bring up specifically at the last meeting our the structural design that we created by not allowing alcohol at gas stations at other places. Because, you know, that is part of the challenge. So if we do afford you this opportunity, why wouldn't every other gas station want the same thing? They will. What? Mm. And so that is part, and I they've don't They've already mean been to, honest about, they want this, yeah. Right, and I, so I don't mean to argue the slippery slope argument, because it's not that straightforward, but nonetheless, the design creates, the design in our code creates it so that we have only liquor stores. And so when we change that, we really harm those businesses because we already designed it so they could have the corner on that market. But really it was to protect students and to protect our community and, and to just make it less accessible, I believe. Um, and so I understand that we already did that and it's kind of we made this special, unique, weird market and if we change it, we affect all of the other businesses that already exist. And so then we're in a position where we really should be accommodating every business. It, it's sort of unfair at that point, and you know, and I want your business to go there, and I want your business to do business. <laughs> but yeah. Yeah, I think that's, I, and that's, I that's the struggle. The I may just Larson. just had one. Sure, one go point. ahead, sir. So, um, just the total square footage of the store is 2,500 square feet, which includes the you know storage area. As far as the sales floor of the space. Uh, the restriction that you have before you is less than 25% uh, of the floor area. And given the other liquor stores that are present in DeKalb, um, I would be very hard pressed to be able to compete with, you know, stores that are 10,000 square feet plus, you know, including the one down the street that Twin, Twin Liquors, if my only business is gonna come from the liquor side and I'd be shooting myself in the foot to come here before you and ask for you know, a license and a layout that would restrict me to 25% of already a small store. If I was looking to open a purely liquor store in DeKalb, there's no way I think you can compete with a store that small. And, uh, you know, and besides that, I think with all the other liquor stores in DeKalb uh, that you go into, you know, you're seeing 80, 90 percent plus of the floor space being used for alcohol sales. So here's here's we talk about the the complexity of that what you just stated would probably be if I had to guess the size of the coolers and the size of the shelf there, but it's also the floor space. So according to your calculation, we'd have to remove all the 
floor space from there to actually calculate the coolers and the shelves, what that floor space is to see if your alcohol is 25%. When I look at it, if I'm just looking at the shelves and the coolers and things like that, the section for alcohol is, is larger than 25%. And this is the problem we have to get into. What, what defines 25%? Do you count the bathrooms? Do you count the entryway? Do you count? And that, that's where I see this as, do we want a liquor store on the corner or not? Because that's, that's the way our liquor license is. Mm -hmm. That's the way we've issued every other liquor license to every other business in our community. And that's what's actually before us. Do we want a packaged liquor store on the corner or not? Alderman Larson. Well, and this might be opening another whole can of worms that we're not going to discuss today, but it comes down to there's so many things that a lot of places that sell packaged liquors, like you said, you go and right there as you're checking out are all the single. It's a shot of alcohol right there. And I know some people might bring them home and make drinks. I worry that a lot of people are going back to work and just drinking that to get through the afternoon. And when you go in and it's like people are buying a big one can of beer that's like half a gallon, and you're telling me they're taking that home, they're popping it as they're driving home. And any of these, what I would call single servings that we currently have, that's what really bothers me about this. If it was, if you would say that all you're having is actually large packages, the smallest is a six pack of, of beer and a bottle of wine, I might be on this. But the minute you tell me that you're going to have the single servings of anything, I'm out. But that's where, that's but, where in that's, that, that yeah. situation where we would have to dictate the business plan, we'd have to enforce, we'd have to check on. And that's where I, I think this conversation ultimately is, do we want a packaged liquor store on that corner or not? There happens to be a deli and all that other stuff with it, but the way our code is and the way we've issued every liquor license so far, it, it's, it's that. Um, so th that, th Alderman Walker. Hey, can I entice you to, uh, to you know, visualize this? We have a lot of good businesses going in there. We have Facebook, you know, we have Heinz Craft, you know, 2025. Can you imagine all the people that will come to your place for lunch and go back to those places. So do you really need the liquor store in order to make this happen? Just think about it. Like, I mean, I know it sounds good. You can sell liquor and do all that, but just think about it. If you can open it without the liquor license and just, you know, I, you know, have snacks and a big deli there, I'm telling you, man, I'm a UPS guy. That would be the hangout spot for us. So I'm just saying, you know, if this doesn't work for you, just think about that. I mean, because I don't want to turn Agreed. businesses away. It's looking like it's not going your way. Mm -hmm. I just don't want to turn you away. I, I really want you to think about it. Just think about the main scope of things. We have all those businesses over in that area, and it's just going to keep growing. So I just really want you to think about that. I don't know if people told you about that, but that could be a nice little lunch spot for a lot of people. So that's all I just want to throw out. And <clears throat> I uh, appreciate those words, certainly. And you know, I want to say, I know on the area of town, it's it's definitely in its current state, it is on the quieter side, and that's, you know, I'm just looking for additional pull to draw people in. I got it. Yeah. Totally understandable, yep. Any other comments or questions, or I'm going to call roll? All right, roll call, please. Oh, sorry. Yeah, come on up. Um, first of all, uh, again, my name is Steve Michaels. And my mom's here, Elizabeth Michaels. We're the property owners. Um, I do want to be absolutely clear. I know I mentioned this in the last meeting. Everyone I've discussed about, you know, filling that location, whether it be a tenant to rent it or someone to buy it, has always brought up, I need a liquor license. Um, I mean, I've talked to numerous people. Um, USERI came out with a plan that I thought met code less than 25%. I know what you said about how can we enforce that. But if, if we don't move on with this, my, my feeling is that place is going to remain vacant because it's going to be very hard for me to find someone to fill it. I've been trying to for the last 18 to 24 months, and I have not been successful until I ran into USERI and he prevent, provided his vision and how we were going to come here and try to support that and get that over the goal line. Um, so I just I think that it's going to be a big challenge. Okay. Yep. Any other comments or questions? All right, hearing none, roll call, please. Walker? Yes. Sasada? 
Yes. Larson? No. Smith? No. Perkins? No. Furbick? No. Mayor Barnes? No. Two aye. All right, so ordinance uh, 2024-012 fails. Sorry about that. Um, I really do think that Alderman Walker talked. Uh, a deli there is going to crush it. Oh, you finally supported me. I always have supported you, man. <laughs> Appreciate um, 100%. it. 100%. Appreciate um, the love. Alderman, uh, not Alderman Walker, <laughs> uh, deli there. I mean, when you look at the restaurant, the pancake houses there does really well. Um, that place is going to be the place for having a restaurant at some point. And I say a restaurant, I mean a deli. Um, so I really hope you still continue to think about uh, pursuing your business there. But thank you guys. All right, moving on to, uh, just give me, oh yeah, ordinance, uh, sorry, agenda item K, ordinance's second reading. We have number one, ordinance 2024-012, amending chapter 67, bar, body art establishments tattooing, section 67.03, qualifications for body art establishment license, section 67.05, public hearing on an application for body art establishment license, and section 67.06, issuance of a body art establishment license. Can I have a motion to bring it to the floor? So moved. Second. Moved by Alderman Zazada, seconded by Alderman Walker. City Manager. Thank you, Mayor. As the, uh, the brief background points out, I uh, brought this forward from uh, the discussion back on the 26th of February. The council was specific about some things they wanted to see. Uh, one was that the, there was an odd uh, public hearing requirement in this that isn't uh, extant in, in other similar matters so the removal of that does not r remove any opportunities for the owner or for the city to to pursue further discussion about things increases the uh, allowable number of body art, art establishments in our downtown area from three to four reduces the minimum distance between body art establishments in the downtown area from 500 to 125 feet so it's consistent with support of this particular proposal which is what the <coughs> council had identified uh, but there is also the caveat that the council asked for, which is in the event that one of the four, if, if you approve this, four currently licensed body art establishments in the downtown area closes, then the cap on such licenses returns to three. Council, questions, comments? Hearing none, roll call, please. Sasada? Yes. Larson? Yes. Smith? Yes. Perkins? Yes. Verbeck? Yes. Walker? Yes. Mayor Barnes? Yes. 7 I. Ordinance 2024-012 passes on second reading. Moving on to number two, ordinance 2024-014, amending chapter 50. Oh, no, we already we moved that from the agenda. So moving on to ordinances. Uh, L first reading, number one, ordinance 2024-020, approving a final plat of the Stockman resubdivision to combine lot 17 and lot 18 in the Woodlawn Acres Subdivision, 802 Woodlawn Drive, uh, Lewis and Rachel Stockman. Give me one sec here. I just want to make sure. All right, can I have a motion to bring it to the floor, please? So moved. Second. Moved by Alderman Smith, seconded by Alderman Verbeck, City Manager. This is a, a minor resubdivision, as you can see from the background. Uh, the um, <coughs> applicants are uh, Rachel and Lewis Stockman, who are looking to expand their their home. Uh, there is a, a lot, a vacant lot available at Nottingham on Sycamore Road. Uh, it used to have a, a, a detached uh, single family home with access directly from uh, Sycamore Road and you can still see that access point. And this, uh, we, we, first of all, we support this resubdivision, but the uh, city engineer uh, proposed and the, the applicants agreed that uh, the access from Sycamore Road would be discontinued. It, it's, it was in a turn lane and it was always, or the beginning of the turn lane, it was always uh, a bit of a problem. If somebody was slowing to pull in there, it, it could create uh, a hazard on any given day. So, City Council, questions, comments? Hearing none, roll call please. Larson? Yes. Smith? Yes. Perkins? Yes. Verbeck? Yes. Walker? Yes. Sasada? Yes. Mayor Barnes? Yes. 7 I. Ordinance 2024-020 passes on first reading. I take a motion to waive second reading. So moved. Second. Moved by Alderman Smith, seconded by Alderman Walker. 
Any questions or comments on that? Hearing none, roll call please. Smith? Yes. Perkins? Yes. Burbick? Yes. Walker? Yes. Sasada? Yes. <clears throat> Larson? Yes. Mayor Barnes? Yes. 7 I. Ordinance 2024-020, second reading has been waived. Uh, moving on to agenda item M, reports and communications, council member reports. Alderman Smith, you want to kick us off? Uh, no report. Alderman Walker. Yeah, I want to give a shout out to Andy Ray and his crew. You know, they stepped up when nobody else would and helped out, you know, uh, a family in the 7th Ward. So shout out to Andy, doing a good job, boss. Alderman Verbeck. No report. Alderman Perkins. Yeah, I'd like to, to take a, a moment to go back to the very first thing that we talked that we discussed this evening, and that's recognition of the middle schoolers. You know, in this age of, of bracketology, um, which is concluding tonight, can, can you imagine winning your bracket and not having a single champion? So what this is is a big thanks and congratulations to those guys because they won a state title but her highest finisher was a second place finisher. And I think what that goes to is just that organization, the commitment of those coaches, those families. Um, I've had boys that have gone through the wrestling program and the commitment that those guys have had for years. I'm sure I'm, sure I'm gonna forget someone, but Weller, Mac, and Kylie, they've been doing this for a long time. And to have this many state qualifiers and to win it with that many state qualifiers, that's a tough path. So thank, thank you, families and coaches, for that commitment. Awesome work. Alderwoman Larson. Um, I just want to do a shout out to the um, County <coughs> Visitors Bureau and the, the amount of different um, athletic events and social events and um, conventions that they've been bringing in to the county and, and the city of DeKalb. And when I start looking at our monthly like taxes on the motels, I mean, it's just skyrocketing you know, month to month. And a lot of that is the work they do to bring things to, to our neighborhood. So I want to thank them for that. All the is out. No report. Yeah, so uh, uh, one, I, I, uh, I, I think everyone here either went to the visitation, the funeral, or uh, got to see the procession of our deputy sheriff, uh, the honor that um, she was given um, for losing her life on duty was, uh, I mean, it, it was incredible. I think uh, I was there at 10, 15 in the morning, 15 minutes after the doors opened, and I bet there was a thousand people lined up going through paying their respects. Um, seeing the fire department with the ladder trucks out and the flag um, was really cool. Uh, police showed up in force and the state police was there. Uh, you know, the towing companies were out. RP Lumber was out. There were American flags. People were on the streets uh, just honoring her memory and her service. Uh, I, I heard from people all over. It was one of the most impactful things they had seen. Um, and for me, it's just incredible to see a community come out uh, and support a family. She had young children, um, and it was, it was quite literally heartwarming just to, to see our community um, rally around uh, someone who you know, gave their life uh, uh, serving. Uh, so that, that, was, that was incredible, and I just want to thank our city staff. I think we probably had every vehicle, snow plow, lawnmower, uh, you name it, out uh, blocking the streets so that procession could proceed to the funeral home uninterrupted. Um, so it was, it was one of the coolest things I, I've, I've had the honor to see in this community. So thanks, uh, Andy, I know your team was a big part of it. Um, Chief Thomas, uh, Chief Bird, um, it was really cool for all of us to take that moment and make sure that uh, we send someone off in, in the right way. So really appreciate it. Um, I also want to say Ward 5 resumes uh, are in. Uh, the deadline was last Friday at 5. Uh, I'm not going to give a date on when I'm going to make a decision. I know what the state statute is and I know when we have to have that, but I'm reviewing uh, uh, resumes right now and we'll have a recommendation to council soon in time for uh, meeting the deadline of state statute on that. But it is great. We have eight people that applied. So we've got a pretty good pool of, of candidates, which is wonderful. Um, some people I had to uh, remind them they don't live in the fifth ward. 
Um, but the eight that I have all reside in the fifth ward, which is great. Um, but it was, the enthusiasm was awesome, you know. Uh, safe passage, I was also at uh, a check giving ceremony from Congresswoman Lauren Underwood on Thursday. Uh, she uh, procured $2.5 million in federal dollars to donate to Safe Passage for their building. Um, that really closed a significant gap for them. Uh, so it was really great to have our U.S. Congresswoman continuing to uh, make DeKalb a priority and bring in a, a seven-figure check was just absolutely incredible. Um, also, I got to go with Egg Toys uh, to Egg Toy Studios with uh, Scott Zach and our chair of our Enhancement Commission. Uh, they're the ones that bought the First United Methodist Church. Really cool. Uh, I, actually, beyond cool. If you have a chance to ever tour their studio, oh my god. Uh, I, I mean, where they're at right now must be 100,000 square foot, Zach. I don't even know. It's massive. Uh, and the uh, United Methodist, First United Methodist Church that they own now is going to be a continuation expansion for them. That's how uh, massive this organization is. So having them come to DeKalb is going to be phenomenal, and they're working with us on some public art in the community, which is really cool, and that's part of the Enhancement Commission is driving that. Um, but other than that, that's uh, all I got. Uh, City Manager? No report. All right. So moving on to agenda item N, executive session. I would take a motion to move the executive session to approve, uh, or sorry, I need a motion to, uh, for approval to hold an executive session in order to discuss Number one, workers' compensation as provided for in 5 ILCS 120-2C12. Number two, executive session minutes as provided for in 5 ILCS 120-2C21. And number three, purchase or lease of real property as provided for in 5 ILCS 120-2C5. Can I have a motion to move into executive session? So moved. Second. Moved by Alderman Zazada, seconded by Alderman Verbeck. All right, we are uh, moving, what? Oh, roll call, sorry. Perkins? Yes. Verbeck? Yes. Walker? Yes. Sasada? Yes. Larson? Yes. Smith? Yes. Mayor Barnes? Yes. 7 I. All right, so our regular agenda, or our regular meeting has been in recess now as we move to a closed session. So all of you, thank you for coming out tonight. Um, you just can't stay here. <laughs>